I'm Wendy Holloway, and you're listening to the Flavor of Italy podcast, sharing the very best of Italian food and wine, lifestyle, and people. This is Wendy Holloway with the Flavor of Italy podcast, and I'm here today with Jeannie Marshall, whom I've known for somewhere between a decade and two decades. And uh, your little boy is not a little boy anymore, but he certainly was then. And um, I know that you've been living in um, Italy now with your family for more than 20 years and that you waited 18 years to go see the Sistine Chapel ceiling, which is pretty amazing. And then as a result, after many visits, you wrote All Things Move, Learning to Look in the Sistine Chapel. Okay, before we get into that, Jeannie, what brought you to Italy? Oh, okay. Uh, adventure, really, I think. I mean, that's how it felt. Uh, but it was a job, but it wasn't my job. I uh, I was working as a journalist in Canada. And uh, I was also, um, my husband was also a journalist. And we had actually tried to go and move to Spain. But it was while we were in Spain that he got a line on a possible short-term job in Rome at a uh, a United Nations agency. And so we decided, oh, let's go. Wouldn't Rome be amazing? So so we went and we thought, we'll just stay a few months. And then there was another job and that was two years. And we thought, well, we'll stay two years. And now the, it's uh, it'll be 22 years in a couple of months. So yeah, a long time. Wow, that's, that's absolutely amazing. And it, it feels to me like I met you early on in your uh, time here in Italy, but maybe I'm not correct on that. Well, I, you know, keep trying to remember when I published my first book. And so that would have been probably about 12 years ago, I think. Okay. So it was before that, but not too much before that. So, so let's backtrack. This book that we're talking about today is your second book, and you are now working on your third book, which is a completely different thing <laughs> altogether, if I'm understanding correctly. Yes, yes. So your first book was The Lost Art of Feeding Kids, What Italy Taught Me About Why Children Need Real Food. So it, it seems to me, based on that book and the book about the Sistine Chapel, although to an, an outsider, they don't seem to be connected. There are threads of what you were experiencing intensely at the time. Yes, that's a that's a good way to put it. Your son was a, a little boy, and you were feeding him eating uh, clams. Yes, <laughs> and sardines and anchovies and things that at first, you know, I'd see him we would be at a table with a, a big Italian families and lots of food being ordered in a restaurant. And I'd see all these little fishes arrive and think, oh, what is he going to do? And, you know, but he just did what all the other kids did. <laughs> so it was great. Just dive in and start eating it. So that to me was like a real education through my own kid to see how, how our food preferences are even formed. And so his were being formed by the environment. And he was really lucky to be growing up in an environment of really good food. But yeah, that was Absolutely. a very journalistic kind of book. I mean, it was a story and it had a personal element to it, but uh, I, I did apply all my journalistic skills to that one, to doing lots of research and interviewing people, and um, but also trying to bring it into what was also a personal story at the same time. Yeah. So your your background is journalism. Is yes. that correct? That's right. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and even the second book, so the Sistine Chapel, the, it's not exactly a journalistic book, but there is, you know, there there is a genre called literary journalism, maybe also literary nonfiction, it's often called. And I, I kind of love it because it's about storytelling, factual storytelling, but making the story, it's not just about the facts, you know, you actually have to weave it into a story. And I'm always thinking, I run into other writers all the time who are saying, oh, that's been done, that's been done, that's been done. But everything's been done. It's all in the telling, you know, so it's the story itself that is, is, is what makes it unique. We all start out in some ways with the same kind of facts. We might differ on a few things, but it's how, 
each person approaches it that makes it different. So to me, I think I thought about it still as being still in the category of journalism to a certain extent when I was doing it, but I really allowed myself to try to be as creative as possible with the way of telling the story because it wasn't an obvious linear story. You know, it has a few strands yeah. that you wouldn't think would go together, but they do. Right. I mean, through the book, you seem to evolve. Well, you did kind of go back and forth from uh, personal storytelling of, you know, your life, intensely your life, and then the historical and artistic background of the Sistine Chapel and what was going on even before and after the painting of the Sistine Chapel. So it became at certain points very much uh, history and journalistic. Yes. Yeah. And of course, I read a lot and did a lot. I just used, you know, sources that are out there. I wasn't digging around in archives or anything because the Sistine Chapel is something that's thoroughly, thoroughly researched already. And that's really available to us. But what I what I wanted to do was, as I started to go through and, you know, spend some time in Sistine Chapel, I started to think about how we look at art and how we don't know how to look at art. Sometimes you can see people looking very confused and you feel it yourself. Sometimes you don't know, what am I supposed to look at? What am I supposed to be experiencing here? So I thought it might be interesting to actually write about my own process of trying to figure that out for myself while looking at something that's actually really famous so it's hard to it's hard to figure out what you are experiencing from what you've already heard and know about it and of course that they mingle together those those strands so so it came to to feel to me like writing about how i'm experiencing it would take the reader along in their own experience you know it's like you kind of go together it's like a like we start out together and it becomes a kind of quest and a, a journey to reach the, ultimately what we're trying to reach is the altar wall. We're going through the Sistine Chapel ceiling piece by piece and we know we're heading to the last judgment, which is on the altar wall and that forms the the end of the book. So that was that made it more interesting to me to even think about my own experience in that way, but also that desire you have to to share it and to bring someone with you. Absolutely. Um, I did a podcast interview about art access for the blind mm. and uh, most specifically works of art, but not exclusively within the Vatican. The interview was with Sabrina Zappia, and that's really uh, her passion and focus. But she relayed an experience she had where she was in the Sistine Chapel looking at it. And she listened, um, as you did when you went many times, to what other people were saying. She ended up having a strong relationship with this uh, Deborah Tramentozzi, who's an Italian woman. And she was talking about, I don't recall now, some aspect within the Sistine Chapel. And Sabrina realized, oh, I've never looked at it that way. I've never that whole aspect escaped me. And it turned out that uh, not only is Deborah Tramontazzi blind, mm. but she was making the art accessible to other blind people. And now in within the Vatican, there, there are works of art where they've um, established a tactile and an audio experience for the blind. Yeah, so that they can have, have an analogous experience, but also their own individual experience of it. Right. So, yes. I mean, you go in there, and, and as you say, you know, some people go in there because they're uh, checking it off of their uh, tourist list. I would probably hate to say that that's the majority, but everyone goes in there with some unique a uh, backstory as they approach it and it might they might be going in really just a ticket off their list or my sense in in your case is that there was this deep rooted or really underground denied relationship with catholicism that you you sort of pushed onto the back burner and through the art figured out exactly what your relationship 
with Catholicism was because of your grandma's uh, strong relationship with it. And then uh, on a different level, your mother's feeling about being a good or bad Catholic. Yes, very much. Another facet of the thing. Whereas I might go in there and although I, I have some spiritual connection, but I wouldn't necessarily be delving in on a religious basis. At one point, it refers to your 15 visits there. I sense it's much more. Yeah, I didn't keep track. Yeah, And of course, reading and rereading a book that you get more out of it each time. Yeah. Oh, I know. But it's funny because I, I really just wanted to go and see it as art. But I knew that that's really hard to do because it's one of the most incredibly famous religious pieces of art as well. So- you know, in, and in trying to figure out how does the whole thing fit together because it's all these different pieces and taking apart the pieces, I did start to realize, oh, it's there's a real theology that's being presented here. And it's not – what amazed me was I realized it's not exactly the theology that my mother felt oppressed by, you know, in the 60s and 70s. So, uh, you know, I did realize looking at the Sistine Chapel when I started taking apart the images that – there was this theology there that was so different and so interesting and so uh, poetic and artistic and and open and not it wasn't uh, to me what I remember my mother finding so objectionable about the Catholicism that she grew up with was that it seemed to always be judging and and oppressing and for her she was still a spiritual person to a certain extent although she didn't really know what to do with it. But she found the structure of the church, she just felt so judged by it that she couldn't really stay there. And when I was looking at the Sistine Chapel, I felt like this isn't about judging people. I mean, they have the last judgment, of course, but it's about questions. It's about asking all of these questions about, you know, origins and where do we come from and all these mysteries and acknowledging that we don't really know, that we have stories and we have ideas, but it's almost an acknowledgement that these are stories and these are ways of knowing something, but we don't have the whole truth. And the more I started to read about the influences that he had, Michelangelo had, uh, one of them was Giles of Viterbo. And he had a very interesting sort of vision of Catholicism, spirituality, Christianity, generally as being artistic as being, that was the way you had to communicate spirituality was through art and he spoke of the this of scripture as having the um, having a poetic veil, and the idea was that simply to ha- to just say it head on, which is something I often say about stories as well. If you just bludgeon people with facts, you're going to bore them. And so, uh, and this was also the truth. You couldn't just go straight on and say this is the meaning of life, and then we'd all be fine. It has to be sort of more diffuse than that. We can only kind of catch it in little bits and pieces and it comes to us through through these these very religious artists. And each person has to, if they do, they have to come to it in their own way. Yes. Yes. And you have to actually be active about it. It isn't a passive sort of thing where you go and uh, you know, go through the rituals, but you don't have any kind of meaning. And of course, around the time that that Michelangelo was painting the ceiling, that was happening. There was a lot of sort of the, we do this and this, we do the ritual, we buy an indulgence, and then we're fine. We don't really have to give it all that much thought or think about it. And we don't have to understand or even strive to understand the thing that we can't understand. So, there was even that sense of being less spiritually engaged and just following steps to be spiritual rather than actually being genuinely spiritual. Exactly. And and you mentioned a, a few things uh, about, uh, you know, you go into the Sistine Chapel, you're dealing with these massive crowds. So you're kind of otherwise focused because of that. You're just navigating the whole thing. You have the shushers, as you say, <laughs> so you can't really engage. And then you mentioned being there with your son. And when he left, he said, Ma, my my neck is sore from looking up. So you you can't, it's so sort of far away and you have all these other distractions. And 
One thing that I found wonderful that was helpful and would make uh, subsequently going into the Sistine Chapel more approachable was the show at the Vatican, the Giudizio Universale, that had sting music and oh. <laughs> things that made sense to people. Did you go to that? No, I didn't. No, no. I didn't. It, it was one of the most fantastic things I've I've done. Very moving. But it's one of these ways that the, the people that put it together sort of translated everything that's there. And it was a multi-sensorial experience with, you know, 3D and really something so marvelous uh, that I went to three times, as I say. <laughs> and I just looked yesterday to see if by any chance it might be coming back, but um, apparently not. So yeah. there are ways that people try to make the whole thing more approachable. And modern and like, yeah, it's relatable now through the centuries. Yes. But it's it's such a hard thing because often if you're going, especially if you're a visitor to Italy, you're probably only going to go one time. So you've there's a lot riding on your one visit. And it is famous. It, it, you know, it suffers almost from its own fame. So you've got all of these things that you already know about it, your own expectations, and probably buried in there too are these questions of you know, is it still relevant? Does it make, you know, what is the point? Why am I going? You know, what, you know, you don't know. So in fact, having something that can make it relatable, I think can help. Someone wrote to me a letter about uh, having just picked up my book on a whim because she and her husband were going to Rome and she read it on the plane on the way over. And she said it did, it helped her to just slow down. She said, and just accept that those questions she was having were normal questions to have. And and just find her way into the city, but also into the Sistine Chapel, into the uh, the images that she was actually there to look at, because they had one visit, they couldn't, you know, they couldn't go twice. So she felt it helped her to squeeze a little bit more out of it. And I think taking any kind of like a, a guidebook, something that just helps you to find an anchor is really useful. Like for me, it was, I, I had read a, a lot of books before, and then I would go there and I would still feel very confused. So often what I would do is I would decide, I'm going to find one thing. I'm going to find Jonah. And then, you know, I'm not be sure exactly where Jonah was. And then in looking for Jonah, I would see other things. But finally, when I would find him, I would have a sense of being anchored. And other, you know, other panels, other images I would look for. And then could go off and branch out after that. But it's just that it is so enormous that you do need a way into it. And just to sort of go in and be confronted by the whole thing is just flattening. You know? it, true. And um, as you say, from the touristic perspective, the last time I went was pre-COVID, and I deeply regret that I didn't go there immediately after COVID. I, I missed my the golden opportunity in, uh, in the midst of this tragedy. But I went with uh, my niece and her two little girls uh, pre-COVID. And even then, it was so crowded. I was focused on, I don't want to lose the girls. Yes. <laughs> uh, you know, where can I find the bathroom for them? We're being told to shut up. And it, it was not a pleasant thing at all. And in many senses, it's the fault of the Vatican. Because if you think about a theater experience, for example, there's a set number of people who go to visit it. And you might get tickets to the theater six months in advance, but you know you've got your seat. But I feel like it's cattle just being yes. uh, pushed through there. And it really takes away from any chance to engage with the experience. Well, it seems almost like they see their jobs as pushing you out of the room. You spent all morning or all afternoon trying to get into the room. And the moment you step in, they're pushing you towards the exit. So that I think they could do better <laughs> for sure. I think that's not a great experience. And I can understand it from their perspective. They want safety. People are looking up. And so it's easy to have someone fall or trip over other people. They have to be sure that nobody sits down because people 
obviously they want to do that. I'd love nothing more than to just lay down on the floor, but that's never going to happen. Yeah, like those ladies did, you mentioned a couple of ladies had done that and were reprimanded. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, so you can understand it's not safe. But at the same time, it would be nice if they could just allow you some way to just be in the room and not just be pushing you out of the room. And it's just that there are always too many people in the room at one time. So I did go just after COVID. And the nice thing about that was that I felt like the guards themselves were also a little bit in awe of what was happening. It was that this room had been closed up. No one was here. And now we're here, only a few people at a time. And we could look around. The disappointing thing was that they taped off the the seats that are around the edge of the room so you couldn't sit down. There was a shame only because it would have been nice you could have sat for five minutes and, you know, been able to rest your head. It's a little easier. But at least there were not so many people and you would catch the eye of other people and you would have a sense of, isn't this incredible, you know, that, that we have this chance to actually stand here and look at it in peace for a few minutes. So, and that also reminded me that it is a shame that it is the way it is. Now, some of it is just that it's a big room, but it's not that big a room. So to have all those people coming through, they do have to manage them. But I don't know what the answer is. You know, there's such demand to see it and you don't want to, you don't want to make it impossible for people to see it or make it such an exclusive thing that only a few people can go, but allowing everyone in also creates its own problem and you don't see it either. But, you know, you can't really restrict it or make it so expensive that only a few people will go because you never know who's going to have that big experience that that you can't tell. You know, you never know. It could be someone who's not really expecting much will go in and have their, their lives sort of, you know, changed. Altered. Yeah. I mean, in some way, you know, whether it's an inner change, a sense that, wow, I I never really cared much about Renaissance art and now I get it. Or maybe it's a spiritual thing. Or it's just that moment like, wow, I never really saw, I never cared about art and now I do. You know, just, you never know what can happen. And there's just something. I just find I, some unexpected things happen when you go to an art gallery and particularly when you have a little bit of time. And I like going by myself. I've, um, it's fun to go with other people, but I never, I end up chatting and we end up making lunch plans and we don't really look at what we're supposed to be looking at and thinking about it. But I love, so I do love to go by myself and go as often as I can. And, you know, I was uh, in Toronto recently because my son is going to university there and I was delighted to see that the Art Gallery of Ontario has created a, a program where I think it's, if you're under 25, you just go in for free. And I thought, that's fabulous because when you're that age, you're impressionable. And to be able to just wander in and maybe look at two things and wander out again is wonderful. That's a real gift. So I'm pushing my my science-oriented son to take advantage of that. <laughs> so I'm thinking that there probably would be a couple of ways, but this is kind of a management, art management in Rome uh, sort of experience to do something like Galleria Borghese, where you have a time slot with a limited number of people. Yes. And you, you know that your time slot is uh, such and such a time instead of, you know, you get in the line in the morning and you wait and wait and wait, but to kind of slot it out. Well, they do, they do that to a certain extent. You can buy tickets online and they are for a certain time. And I think they try to control the numbers, but it's just that it's such a big place that there are people bunch up in different areas. And so you end up with a bottleneck in certain spots. And then certainly you end up with a lot of people who want to spend more time in the Sistine Chapel. Then I think the time is allotted. So you end up with a lot of people in there and they're trying to shove you out. So maybe, I don't know if there could be a way of, you know, you have this much time in the gallery and then you should be at the Sistine Chapel at this time, but that would also be hard. But I think just so you're not as distracted from all the people around you and the shushers and everything, maybe as you say, go alone or try to have an alone experience, even if you're with people. But I think an audio guide could be great. So you're listening to something else, digging deep and digging deep and going back maybe reflecting and going back again, that really takes you to a very unique place. 
Well, thank you so much, Jeannie, for taking the time to talk about your book. I think it's a great intro for uh, someone coming to Rome, so I'm definitely going to have this on my recommendation list for visitors. If there's someone you think would enjoy this episode and loves this topic, please share it with your friends and family. You've been listening to the Flavor of Italy podcast. Find us at www.flavorofitaly.com and on Instagram, Pinterest, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn, always as Flavor of Italy.